Jesus is as close to the Father as no one else can ever get. He's being worshipped by millions of angels and saints in glory. Praise and worship is going on full speed. Is there a better place to be than that one? No. And still he says, if some of you gather, I will come. Mm. That's a privilege, you know. Uh, the Lord rebuked me because I took it so flippantly. Okay, Lord, we gather in your name, we open this meeting. Okay, first point on the agenda. And the Lord came and said, hey guys, I'm here, you know. So let's take a moment and more than just pray, meditate, that we are about to invite the Lord to come and to preside over our meeting and to talk to us. He will speak in our hearts, he will speak through someone else, he may speak through a scripture, but he will speak. Remember, he says, dwell in my words so that whatever you ask in prayer will be done by the Father. I mean, can it be any better than that? Mm. And then we'll pray for Mark, <laughs> okay? Let's do that. For him. <laughs> and for me, yeah. <laughs> Lord Jesus, we humble ourselves. We are your people. We are called by your name. What a privilege that we are Christians. And we, we have the mark of God on our foreheads. So often we give so much importance to the mark of the beast, but we have the mark of God on us. And so we gather in your name, we invite you to come, we bow before you, Lord Jesus, and you made us kings and queens over different areas. And now we take off our crowns, let's do it, and we put them at your feet. And we say, Lord, everything we have that is good has come from your hand. Mm. And we put that crown at your feet and we proclaim from the chairman to the lowest ranking member in this gathering, you are the king of kings. You are the Lord of lords. You are the chief shepherd. We honor you. We bow before you. We welcome you, Lord Jesus. And we open our hearts for you to speak to us as the board goes through the agenda, as people listen to each other. Give us that sensitivity to hear your voice in whatever shape or form you have allowed us to do it. And now, Lord, in that context, we pray for your servant, Mark, and we bless him right now. And we speak life, and we send spirit and life to him, and for his body to be restored and for all of us who need a touch from you, Lord, we declare that only you can take away our life. The devil may threaten us with a fear of death, but only you can decide when we are going to die. So, Lord, we pray for Mark, we pray for everybody in this gathering, and we thank you that we know you heard our prayer. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Take a moment now and dwell in the presence. Just dwell. Do this exercise. Move your hand, but don't slap anybody. Just move it. What do you feel going through your fingers? What do you feel? It's the presence of God. He came. Spirit is Numa. It's a spirit. He's here. That changes the meeting, folks. I'll tell you, this changed my life and Ruth's life totally and our family's life. To know, yesterday we celebrated uh, Ruth's birthday and we invited Jesus to come in and boy, he messed up everything. I mean, mm. we had the best celebration with prayer and thanksgiving and fun and jokes. and So dwell on that. Can I proceed to the devotional? Okay. I'd like to share with you, you know, we all have prayers that we pray consistently with full faith, quoting the scriptures, and fully persuaded that those are legitimate prayers. 
that they are based on promises that God made. You do this, I'll do that. And I think all of us have at least one or more of those prayers that haven't been answered. You know, uh, we say, but Lord, it's written, you know, as for me and my house, we will serve you. And the kids are not walking with the Lord as they should. Lord, you said that by your stripes we have been healed, and we claim it, and we claim it, and we are not healed. I'm sure you have some of those, you know. And then at that moment we become very vulnerable because the enemy tells us, okay, where is God? I mean, if he didn't answer this prayer, what assurance do you have that he will answer other prayers as well? And I want to bring up to you folks, because Ruth and I have a couple, more than a couple of those prayers that are not being answered. And uh, as far as we know, we walk in holiness, we cry out to God. And the, the challenging thing is that we minister to other people that have the same needs that we have. And bingo, they get an answer. And we are left holding the hat there. We say, come on, Lord, I mean, you did it for him. Why don't you do it for me, mm. you know? Have you had any of those experiences, you know? And so the three heroes, one in the Old Testament and two in the New Testament, one is David in the Old Testament, and in the New Testament is Jesus, and Paul. And you know what they have in common? That all three pray prayers that they were sure God will answer. And God says, no dice. David says, you know, in First Chronicles 12, I intended to build the house for the Lord. I made preparation, not only building materials, the guy wrote over a hundred songs, okay? He organized things, he secured the land. He had the impeccable credential. He was ready to go and say, stop. You won't do it. Your son will do it. And I'll be a father to your son. That was quite a disappointment. And so often we work hard and diligently. We go by the book. We pray. We follow every directive, right? We say, God, you're going to move, right? Oh, I'm not moving. And look at Jesus. Three times he told the Father, would you please pass this cup? Before he, in a holy sense, bragged that anything I ask, the Father does it. I never do anything that the Father is not doing. I have a 100% batting average. <laughs> and in the hour of greatest need, the Father says, no. And now we go to Paul, who wrote two-thirds of the New Testament, who planted more churches than anyone else. But he's the hero that I'm sure all of us, myself for sure, would like to come within 10 miles of where he went. And he says, you know, God allowed a messenger of Satan, not in my neighborhood, not in my household, in my flesh, to torment me. And three times I pray, and three times he says, no. Folks, here we have three incredible men of God that I submit to you that they became great because when God said no, rather than getting bitter or turning the back, they said, okay, Lord, your grace is sufficient, because that's what God says to Paul. And in fact, you know, when Paul says that, he says, I'll go on to the visions and revelation from the Lord, Second Corinthians 12. And he lists them. You know, I went up to the third heaven, and I was there, and I saw things that no other human being has seen. Wow. And then he says, therefore, and every time you see it, therefore, look what is there for. Therefore, in order to keep me from becoming conceited, 
I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. And folks, take a moment now and reflect in moments in your life where God really showed up beyond anything you expected. There is a plaque at the entrance in the other campus about Cliff receiving something from God and coming to the board at the moment when the board had the back against the wall. Humanly speaking, it was a no-go. And it was in that moment of weakness where we were out of everything that God came through. And that is the point I want to share with you folks. When we are weak, he's strong because his power is perfected in our weakness because there is one thing that God will not share with anyone and it's his glory. And time and again, through our intellect, through our giving, it makes me sick. People that have big foundations, they brag about how much they give, and they hire a CEO to tell people no without feeling guilty. And then they gather together, and they look like, but listen, it's when we don't have, when we reach the end of ourselves, that we are welcome into the sufferings of Christ. You know, when he has to say, Father, Father, why have, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He who was with God from the beginning, by whom everything was formed, he who walked with God faithfully every day, he's hanging on a cross, tormented by the devil and his demons, and he addresses him twice as my father, my father, forgive them, they don't know what they are doing. But then he addresses him as my God, because at that moment God ceased to behave like a father and chose to behave like a God. And he took the eyes off Jesus so that he put, put them on us, because at that moment the blood of Jesus paid for our sins. And I should mean to you folks that we are in a season when Hebrews 12, 27, we are not even halfway through it. God says once and for all, this is the final play. This is God's holy mail pass at the end of the age. Once and for all, I will shake the systems of the world. And the unseen the spiritual powers, I will shake them. And that's what he's doing right now. You see, when those principalities and power have co-opted governments and social media and judiciary and political parties and evil is all around us, he says, I will shake them. And only that which is unshakable will remain. Mm. And what is the only thing that is unshakable? I will build my ecclesia upon this rock that I am the son of the living God, the Christ. <coughs> and I, I will build my church and nothing will shake us. So folks, we live in a season where God is shaking. In the Bible and in history, I see two patterns. There is a pastoral season when God takes care of the people and builds them up until they reach an optimal point you know, and when they reach that optimal point and they begin to get organized to preserve that, God allows a crisis. Just look at crisis in the Bible, famine, persecution, illness, martyrdom. All of those produce growth because it's a shift from the pastoral to the apostolic. And if you don't shift, you get attached to the, you remain attached to the umbilical cord. And the umbilical cord is vital for the embryo to develop. 
But once the baby comes out, that umbilical cord becomes poisonous if you don't cut that. And that's why we live in a season. If we look at our history, our walk with the Lord, all of us, our walk with the Lord here at Valley Christian, I mean, there have been seasons where we were at the very end of everything, and we cry out to the Lord, knowing that only God could have rescued us. And he did it time and again, time and again. And the danger is to become stewards of yesterday's manna rather than people that seek God for fresh manna, people that put everything on the table and in a holy sense we roll the dice. I think I shared with some of you several years ago, about four years ago, I was speaking in Singapore at a gathering of 14,000 leaders. It was a magnificent gathering, and a number of people that are significant leaders in the body of Christ were speakers. I counted the privilege to sit next to these men and women, but I happened to be the keynote speaker, part of the grace of God. And that morning at 6.22, God woke me up. I never heard his voice. But he told me, Ed, I'm growing tired. Impatient was the word. Because everything my people asked me, I gave it to them. They asked for bigger churches, they got them. They asked for provision, I gave them more than what they asked. They asked for bigger companies, I honor that. But they are not asking me for what I really want to give to them. And I said, what is it, Lord? Read Psalm 2.8. Ask me, and I will give you nations and the earth as your inheritance. Go and tell them that if they don't do that, I'm going to do something dramatic. Well, I felt like telling, Lord, you chose the wrong guy. You know, I'm not a prophet. I'm just a boring Bible teacher. And now I need to tell these giants, okay, that God is going to rebuke us. But I got on my knees before the people. I took off my shoes. I said, this is holy ground. And I gave the message. And everybody wept. And everybody came forward. I took it 14,000 people. Everybody wept. And nothing changed. They went back to counting attendance and offerings. Making prosperity within the four walls and misery within a mile of those four walls. Now, I'm not saying God created COVID. I'm not saying he initiated it. Like many tragedies in life, I believe God allows them for a, for a purpose. And I submit to you respectfully that Valley Christian is no exception. You see, we can remain pastoral, we can protect what we have, or we can allow God to take us beyond where we are. Why? because it is in our weakness that his power becomes perfect. I'm a student of several things, economics, politics, and revivals. Every revival that produced growth, without exception, happened outside the church. Hmm. The church never gave birth to a revival that produced growth. It gave birth to revivals of praise and worship and better discipleship, but when it comes to church growth, it happened outside. The most recent was the Jesus Revolution. Hippies that smelled terrible, smoked marijuana, got saved, and all of a sudden they show up in church, and the church doesn't want them around, right? And then they begin the, the Jesus movement that really, really changed the, the face of Christianity. So in conclusion, what is the value? Well, this is what I see. During the persecution, you can remain pastoral, and God will allow you to remain in Jerusalem and not be persecuted like the apostles. Because you're okay taking care of this establishment. Or God will give you the privilege to sail on our charter waters and be apostolic and try new things out there. Take everything that you have and put it on the table. 
with trials and tribulations. The Bible says it is through many tribulations that we will enter the kingdom of God. It doesn't mean we're going to be saved by tribulation, but for the kingdom of God to be manifested on earth, there is a process where we go through tribulation. So in that context, look what Peter says. The end of all things is near. Therefore, be clear-minded and sober so that you can pray and prepare yourselves, pay attention to this, for the grace that is about to be revealed. And then he says, do not be surprised at the fiery trial that has come upon you as though something strange were happening to you, but to the degree that you suffer, rejoice. And that is an oxymoron. <laughs> How can you rejoice? The more you suffer, the more you rejoice? It's a contradiction. But it's here, right? Don't kill the messenger, right? So we keep reading, right? Until you share in the sufferings of Christ so that you may be overjoyed on the revelation of his glory. And in the old paradigm, I used to think, oh, that means I'm going to suffer here, and when I go to heaven, I will see his glory. No. It's his glory down here. Think of the people that have really blessed you the most, and not the people with the most money or the most talent, and usually people that have gone through a lot of hardship. I tell pastors, do not despise intercessors. Oh, they are all broken up people. They have crazy marriages. They have rebellious kids. They have no... But you know what the point is? It is true. Those intercessors have broken marriages, some of them. They have deep wounds. But rather than turning their back on God, they hang on to God. And they began to know God infinitely, because like Job, who lost everything, says, I know that my Redeemer lives, even though I haven't seen him, and that in the end he will stand on the earth, he will reveal himself. And after my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh I will see God. Look at the context, his skin is being destroyed. But I will see God. I myself will see him with my own eyes. I and not another. How my heart yearns within me. And that is the secret to Job's, Job's Job endurance. When God is playing ping pong with the devil, the greatest honor you and I can aspire is to be the ball in that game. And have God hit that ball, and the devil hits it back, and God hits it back until he, boom, does it. I remember the per one of the persons that influenced me the most was a gentleman who was the most fatherly man I knew. And I said, what is the secret? And he told me, Ed, I am the result of a rape. My mother was a servant, raped by her master. She was thrown out of the house with me in her womb. She was rejected, made an outcast. So God dumped a truck of lemons on him. But here his mother made lemonade. And that is the thing I'm challenged by now. Whether it's relevant for you or not, you be the judge. But folks, we can remain experts at what God already did or aspire to become beginners of what he's about to do. And that requires humility. Sure. That requires to say, Lord, like Dave Thompson likes to say, ignorance <clears throat> in the presence of God is your greatest asset <laughs> because then you ask and you say, okay, Lord, what are you saying? So, in closing, folks, God reveals his glory in us 
from Buya. He gives us preferential treatment. I remember when our daughter Evelyn developed a very, very bad uh, condition, and the doctor says, you don't, it's very iffy, we're going to take her. She was an emergency, and I have a trip to Argentina. And it was a crucial trip. I said, what do I do? Do I cancel? There were no iPhones, no internet. It was going to be a major chaos if I cancel. So I prayed with Ruth, and we say, let's talk to Everett Marilyn and see what she thinks. They say, should I go? She says, Daddy, go. The Lord will be with me. So with her blessing and my wife, I got on that plane, and that was a turning point in our ministry, although every day I was just melted before God. It's interesting that during the time that she was in the hospital, anything she wanted, she got it instantly. I would like to have orange juice. Here it is. I would like to have, here it is, here it is. Why? Because she was going through a tough time and the glory of her parents was upon her. When she came out of the hospital, she asked for the same things and she got, go and help yourself. <laughs> because you no longer get the glory resting upon you. So think of these two parked in the positive place. How many times in those moments when everything was dark, the glory of God was upon you? How many times people came and told you, you bless me like no one else, and deep down you are crying for the same blessing? And God tells you, my grace is sufficient. And folks, that is what will sustain us. But I think that Valley Christian, as well as in TOW and other ministry, so much has been entrusted to us that I don't want to face the Lord with a general ledger of all the good things that I finished the race with. I want to run to the very end. I want even my last check to bounce because I'm trusting God to provide and I will live to the very maximum everything. So folks, as you go through the agenda, and then as you go home, meditate on this. This may not apply to you. I'm not here to dictate how you should feel or you should behave. I'm just another fellow saint. But I can tell you this. There is such a, such a comforting uneasiness to be in the presence of God and not being in control of the outcome. To be in the presence of God and realizing that he may want to perform a miracle. And if you can do it, it's not a miracle, right? It has to be a miracle. If you haven't done it, I encourage you to reread Cliff book, books, actually, the first two. And you will see time and again the hand of the Lord breaking through. That should be the pattern. This is your chaplain talking to you going forward. That should be the pattern, you know. Because my power is made perfect in weakness. So, Father, I pray that as we take a stock of our own journey, and I walk with you. I pray, Lord, that if there is any value in what I have shared, anything that can be an encouragement to anyone here, that you make it relevant. And if, if that is not the case, Lord, thank you for the opportunity to address this wonderful group of friends. But I pray with my brothers and sisters for Valley Christian. I pray for the board and the leadership team and the teachers. And we pray, Lord, for a move of God in our midst. Let it, let it come in whatever shape or form. And Lord, deliver us from fear of changes and, and tribulations and persecution. And show us that even when we are shaking on the rock, the rock never shakes under us. This we humbly pray 
in the name of Jesus, who is here with us today. Amen. Amen. Lord, I like to